What's up, everyone? Welcome back to the Empowered Athlete Podcast. In today's episode, I'm chatting with Liz Mitrovich. She is a first degree black belt who trains out of Precision Jiu Jitsu Academy. She has a full time job working as a senior environmental scientist specialist for the California Department of Cannabis Control, which is super awesome. And she's also a multiple time champ. She's an adult nogi pan champ, euro champ, world champ, and also the most recent West Coast trials winner, which was super exciting to watch you just kick ass on that scene. And just your face in the final was just amazing. Just knowing that like, holy crap, I'm going to ADCC. Um, so I'm, you know, been friends with you for a while, seen you at the tournaments, you know, for many years. And I'm really excited to have you on here just to share a little bit more about your journey, how you balance, you know, working full time while being a high level competitor. And specifically, I think what's really interesting about you and where people will find a lot of value is being a master's athlete fighting in the adult division um, and just like navigating that. So I'm curious about, you know, your journey and doing that as well. Um, so thanks for being on the show. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Um, thank you so much for having me. <laughs> yes. So why don't we just start with like a brief overview? I'm sure that being a first degree black belt, you've been doing this for a while. So just kind of the the summary of your jujitsu journey from like white to black and like your experience so people can just get to know you and your journey a little bit. Uh, okay. So I started training back in 2014. So I just hit my 10 year anniversary uh, for jujitsu back in February ish. Um, I started because I, when I went to college, I wanted to continue to stay active. And one of my friends recommended doing um, another martial art called Hapkido. And I did that all throughout college. And once I got my black belt in that, I taught for about a year or so with the other instructors. And I really enjoyed teaching, but I just knew I wanted to learn more. So then I found is either between um, judo or jujitsu. And uh, because I'm in Sacramento, there is a higher recommendation for the jujitsu schools over the judo schools. Uh, I still want to get my black belt in judo. Um, Jiu-jitsu is just overtaking it. So I started there, but one day I'll go back and um, get my work to get my black belt in judo. Um, it's, it's just like a life goal of mine to do that. Um, so I'll have to talk to you because I know that you have some background in that. Um, yeah, I was going to ask, do you have any ranking in judo? No. So Hapkido, it's um, a Korean Japanese martial art. So it has its roots with the kicks from Taekwondo and its uh, throws from Judo. Okay. Uh, so there's quite a bit. And that's why I wanted to either do Jiu Jitsu or Judo, uh, because I I love throws. Uh, I really do. That's and a the better thing, because I mean, when I think of you, I think of you more as a guard player. So that's now gonna nice turn, that's going to be a nice turn of events for people when you start really adding that to your arsenal, doing judo and doing the takedowns and things like that. I mean, you already have a dangerous, flexible, long leg guard. So just adding some takedowns is going to be a game changer, make you even more dangerous. Yeah, well, it's because my background was in Hapkido. I actually going from white to black, I primarily was a top player. Like okay. I fought for the takedown. I d tried to do throws. Um, I would wrestle a lot because I started at um, Uriah Faber's Ultimate Fitness under Dustin Akbari. And Dustin Akbari, he's a very aggressive um, competitor um, and he loves wrestling. And so especially being with Alpha Male and all of their wrestling, it was really encouraged to play top game. So I was from white to black it took changing schools in the pandemic, even though I was playing guard quite a bit. Um, I, it took the pandemic for me to actually change schools and uh, completely change my game to being a guard player. So I didn't actually start playing guard until 2021 Master Master Worlds. That was the first time they're like, you should just go for it. Go in there and just see what happens. Um, awesome. And it completely changed everything. Um, I'm so sorry about the the uh not finishing the question but yeah that's yeah no that's perfect. that's perfect I actually started really um taking my guard game seriously when I got to black belt as well I was like you know I'm a white belt again what have I been avoiding or where are the biggest holes that 
I really know that I should be doing. And the, my, the way that, especially like my division being smaller and everything, like, and having a lot of background for many years in judo, I was always a top player. So I was like, well, that's where I know my bread and butter is. That's where I have the most confidence. So now that I'm a white belt again, it's time for me to really develop my confidence where I'm not confident. And that's going to be my guard. Well, I was really good at closed guard, but the open guard, I was like, hell no. <laughs> so that's where I was like, okay, that's where I'm going to start really expanding. So it's really interesting that you kind of did the same thing, you know? Um, yes, recently. same thing. That's awesome. So I'd love uh, to, that's like a beautiful overview just of, you know, you're a little bit of your background and kind of where you're at now. And so tell me a little bit about how it's been, obviously you fought as a master athlete, right? You fought as a master athlete. So I'd love for you to kind of share from your experience, how is it being a master athlete fighting in the adult division? If you also want to kind of explain a little bit about any differences that you've noticed in fighting in the master's division as well as the adult division? So, uh, time limit because obviously it's black belt. That's the biggest difference is like the time limit of each match. But if there's anything else that you notice having experience in both divisions. Uh, so I started when I was uh, 23 and uh, jujitsu, I mean, so I had quite some time fighting in the adult division. Um, I started competing probably with like, two or three months into my journey. Um, oh, hello, cinnamon. Um, <laughs> so I, I feel like part of part of why I fight in the adult division is because I fought for I fought in it when I was a colored belt. And then once I got to my black belt in 2019, I was 29. So I still I couldn't fight in the um, couldn't fight in the master's division yet. So I I continued to fight in the adults. And I, by the time I turned into a master's athlete um, in 2020, I I still felt like there's a lot of master athletes in the adult division. So master one is still an incredibly competitive uh, division to be in because you have athletes that are still training in the adult and also training in the masters, um, in master one. And for me, I didn't really feel there's a big difference between the two divisions. And I will say, like, I've been competing in it. Um, I'm 33 now, I'll be 34 later this year. I finally feel like there's like a slight difference. Um, one of them is like, I'd say strategy is huge. So there, the time limit matters only because I think master one is harder to fight in. And that's because of the, the cadence of how you're allowed to attack 10 minutes, you get a lot of strategy to figure out the black belt. And I feel that when you have four less minutes when you're going against other black belt, it is incredibly difficult, regardless of um, of division for age. I find like the less time I get to figure out how to compete against that black belt, it makes it just slightly more difficult. Um, it just changes the whole cadence of the whole match. So I feel like that it's... <laughs> For me, I find having the extra time much uh, easier. Now, mm -hmm. for like body wise, like we, I feel like the men's divisions. I mean, we're wrong in this. The cadence is much like the pace is much faster. Whereas, um, in regardless of divisions, and I feel like, uh, especially since I'm on like the higher end of the weight divisions, um, that I feel like the pace is just a little there really isn't much of a difference between master one and adult. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah. It's, it's very minimal. If you, if you've ever thought about competing, if you're ladies out there, if you ever thought about competing as a, um, into the adult division, go, go out and challenge yourself. Like you, I understand that it's not our division, but if you are doing really well in masters, try to challenge yourself and go down an age and see how it feels for you. Because, um, and I'm sure as I get further down the master's line, I'm sure it will get, my body will start to, um, just slow. It's just how our bodies are. I'll start to get slower. I, I'm going to start losing, um, if I don't work at it, I'm going to lose muscle and bone density. <laughs> um, all, all of the things that happens when you start getting older. Um, yeah. but for now I, I feel like where I'm at with a master one, almost into or like two more years, I think to master two, I think 
I'm at that range where I can still be competitive. You just have yeah. to work at it. Yeah. Yeah. 100%. Well, that was one of the other uh, things I was going to ask you is more if you had, and you kind of gave some advice for those who are master athletes who want to do adult, but feel afraid. I don't know if you necessarily had that experience of having that fear because you were just in adult most of your career. Um, but that's just one of the things that I notice. like when I'm talking with women, the biggest thing is like, it'd be nice to do adult, but that, then there's always that, but afterwards and some type of like limiting belief around, you know, most of the time it's that age related. And I think that, like you said, if you're taking care of yourself or if you want to do the adult division, you probably need to be a little bit more precise and focused in some of the areas that maybe you can get away with. I would say you can't get away with it really in masters. Cause again, they're tough women too, but like, but being that it is a 10 minute match, you know, if you are a black belt, it is something you need to condition for because it's, it's double the length, you know, almost double the length. And so that's not something you can just kind of run into. So I can see where the hesitancy, the fear comes in. If you don't feel like you have that conditioning, you know, ready for something like that, especially if you're doing multiple matches, if you keep winning. Yes. Yes. And I will say it's like uh, one of the cool things, at least with IBJDF, I know that master athletes speaking, there's other organizations, but I'm going to talk about IBJDF because uh, their rules specifically state, it's like you have to have at least two match lengths. So that's 20 minutes. So you have quite a nice amount of time, sometimes more at the majors that you get a cool down and wait in between. So it's kind of nice to know that it's like, okay, you're going to have 10 minutes and then you get at least two matches to calm down for a second, catch your breath and then ready your mind to go again. Yeah. Um, that was interesting that you said, and it's really, I think also stylistic when it comes to the matches, because we, I have this conversation a lot um, with one of my other teammates who is more of a slower fighter and like likes to pace things out and so for her like the 10 minutes she doesn't fight an adult a lot but I feel like she would actually do really well because of the same thing that you said of like she's actually somebody who would do better she does better when the matches are longer because she finally hits her stride after almost the six minute mark so she has like four more minutes to work and it was an interesting perspective that you shared of like feeling out the fighter and like having more time to do that and seeing that as like a opportunity versus like being a little feeling daunted by the length of time and being like, this is actually an opportunity because you can pace yourself a little bit better. For me, that's interesting because <laughs> when I fight the adult division, I'm such a fast paced fighter. Again, I fight feather, yes. so I fight the smaller division. So we tend to be faster. My, my, the nature of my game is pretty aggressive, fast paced. So I remember doing adult divisions and like, I'm going full speed as I normally do. And I look at the match, I'm like, oh my gosh, this is, it's interesting that I can be like, this is right about time when the timer would go off, like in the dojo. <laughs> like, and then I look up, I'm like, oh my God, this is exactly halfway. I can't believe we have halfway. So there's like a pro and a con that I've experienced, which is like, there's this rule. I forget exactly if it has a title or where exactly it came from, but it's like, if you are given more time with something, you're going to utilize that time. So this goes with every rule, like procrastination or just like doing work. Like if your boss tells you, you have an hour to do this, you're probably going to take the whole hour. But if they're like, you have 20 minutes to do this, you're probably, you're going to take 20 minutes. And it's really just because you're given that a lot of time that like we tend to use that. So it's interesting because you can either see it from that perspective of feeling out your opponent, taking your time with it and kind of like utilizing that full 10 minutes to, you know, your advantage, or you can still have that mindset of like, get it done in two minutes so that you don't have to go the 10 minutes, which is more how I've adapted my game, mainly because of what we talked about earlier, which was judo with judo being two, three minute matches. When I competed in judo, that was actually what really stuck with me in translating to jujitsu because First of all, you know that stand up is taxing. So the incentive, <laughs> the incentive to get it over with is very high because it's very cardio based. So when I had two, three minutes for a match in judo to win it, I was able to translate that to jujitsu and kind of just like we start on our feet. So like my goal is finish this in two, three minutes. But again, like you said, like the 
pace is a lot faster. So I think it's interesting and um, just an interesting conversation to have around like knowing maybe your style too. And like, if your style fits better with a longer pace match, maybe you're a slower, you know, you get into the match a little bit slower, maybe despite your age, the adult division would actually be better for you as far as your performance and your result. Yeah, absolutely. And alongside that, um, I've, you're, you're talking about like the, like, I don't know if you do six minute rounds, but like our gym does six minute rounds. And when I was coming back in 2020, uh, coming into working into the competitive season for 2021, I, I hit the six minute mark. And I remember going to compete for the first time being back and looking up and like, oh man, this, I hit the six minute mark. I have four more minutes to go. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, <laughs> So like I, I hear I hear you on that so well. Um and I think to help with that, like I'll do double rounds in practice. So it makes me go for 12 minutes. So I'll help with that. And um another thing I'll do is similar to I want to try to get it done as fast as possible. Um and be considerate to my partners. So like I'll in the gym when I'm preparing for competition or something like that, I'll think about if I can um if I score first, go through the whole entire sequence of whatever, of whatever I'm working on and submit the person, whatever happens after that, I know that it's, that yeah. that's just the it's rest fun. of, exactly. Yeah. So it's funny. It's, I like you utilizing a little bit of both. Um, that's a really interesting perspective that I actually agree with. Like usually as soon as we slap up, I'm like, because I am a competitor, I have that like mindset again, not being mean or anything like that. But just like my goal is like, let me get to where I want to get to. And then I kind of just note it for my own personal growth, like as far as competitive. Okay, I was able to get a sub by two minutes. Okay, now the rest of the match is just going to be fun play. Like we'll still work towards our stuff. But like ultimately I got to where I needed to be when it comes to competition. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And and then you can still continue to work and develop. Uh, I don't know, because fellow female black belt like it's like we still I feel like we as leaders in the gym we need to help lift up the rest of the the younger colored belts and bring them under the fold whether and allow them to work and help provide that space for them even as competitors providing that um space for them it's really important yes 100 percent. and that's a great way to kind of have the best of both worlds where you're kind of focusing on your goals and like you know, gunning for what you want. And then once you get that, like, it's like, okay, the rest of the match, like, it's not like if I allow you to do something, I'm not going to be learning. Like I'm going to be honing some different aspect of my game, but also giving you that space and opportunity to also work something too. So it gets to be a synchronicity, a kind of um, just a, a really mutually beneficial relationship. Yeah. So with you being a full-time worker um with california and you know full-time competitor what is your typical schedule just out of curiosity your typical schedule of like life look like being a full having a full-time job as well as you know how you integrate your training schedule and what does that look like and does that shift when preparing for competitions but even like higher level competitions like maybe like pans or worlds or something like how do you kind of make those adjustments man um Okay, so schedules, schedule, schedule, schedules. Like if you Work schedule your for, life schedule. Yeah, <laughs> I try. I try my best, and even I try my best to write out a schedule for the week and kind of have a a plan for what I'm trying to like the I, most perfect. Everything goes exactly how I want it. Plan. So that's currently and and for the most part, it's like training six days a week. Um, I work, in, as you said, like, so I, I work, so I try to get my accessory work um, of cardio or strength and conditioning done in the morning so that I can work during the day and then at night go train. Um, and sometimes that doesn't work out. Sometimes it does. And with that, you have to buy, provide yourself grace. Um, know that like, you need to be adaptable. Um, so having a plan is uh, really important, but if life throws its way at you, you need to be able to roll with the waves and continue to uh, persevere and tell yourself like, I'm doing the best I can. And I was able to control what I can control. 
because you can't control everything in life. And if you fixate on that, that's when you start having the, uh, or at least for me, when I had my schedule and it wasn't working out when I first started this, it really uh, stressed me out like because I'm, I'm a perfectionist and I'm really working hard <laughs> at allowing myself grace when things aren't perfect yeah. um, because unfortunately life isn't perfect and it's okay not to be perfect. You're going to do the best you can. Absolutely. And I think it's just really inspiring to hear from somebody who is a high level black belt for those who are, whether they're black belts or most of the time, maybe lower belts listening to this. Um, but the fact that you're still able to ex- see high level success and you're not training three times a day, like a, you know, 18 year old, um, art of jujitsu, uh, <laughs> type of athlete. And I think that's what really deters people from even putting in their purview of a higher arching goal because they're just like, well, I, they kind of already write themselves off of like, well, I don't have the capacity or bandwidth or ability within my schedule or where I'm at in life to be able to train three times a day. Therefore, I probably would never be able to see myself on the top of the podium at Worlds, right? And I think you sharing the reality of, you know, life, which is being a human of having a job and still being able to integrate your training and just what you're doing is just finding that way to integrate both so that you can have both of those goals, you know, it's still, and you're not breaking your back, you know, you're doing it pretty balanced. Six days a week is pretty good, you know, versus like three times a day, seven days a week, which I just don't believe yeah. it's sustainable regardless. Um, but it's still possible to reach those goals. And I think you're a great kind of role model for that. Thank you. I'm I will say for training, one of the things I'll do um, is I'll always make sure I go in with a goal. So I try, like in my scheduling, I um, I live by that. The I believe you actually have uh, or have had uh, the best self. The oh, yeah. their journals. I I pretty much use them. I have. Um, so if you guys don't know what best self is, it's a journal. It's a thirteen week gold journal uh, book, and it keeps you on track. It try to like help you under. Um, try to achieve breaks down and tries to help you achieve your goals really easily. Um, I love those books because I'll use them for seasons. So uh, just starting a new one, getting ready for the ADCC worlds. Um, but I use that. I track it every day and I'll write down like, what are my goals for practice? So like um, when I was first starting to really take IVGDF uh, seriously for competing and it was like, okay, um, at the end of each round, what are my what are my points that I've scored? Um, so that it one teaches me how to go through the points, and it teaches me to try to achieve my goal, which is to win on points, uh, win on points because it is practice. You do need to develop your skills and all of that. Um, but I would write down like different types of goals to try to uh, keep my mind engaged, so that I might not have the quantity of practices, but I have quality practices. And yeah. it really helps. Uh, so Love make sure if you're going to be, yeah, it, it helps. And I also do drilling too. So I firmly, I'm a driller. I firmly believe in drilling for myself. <laughs> um, I know it doesn't work for everybody, but that's, that's a okay. Um, I find that when I drill, um, I, I have the, the month, the, what is it? Muscle memory, the mental, yeah, the muscle memory for it. It just helps my body react so fast. I don't have to think about it. I, I learned that it like white to blue belt when I started drilling. It's like, oh, I guess there is something about this drilling thing. Yes. <laughs> yes. I mean, I don't know who would honestly say drilling is it for them. I mean, at the end of the day, I feel like if somebody says that, it just means that you probably just suck at it. And that's probably <laughs> normal because you're probably new at it, right? Anything, if you decide to start drilling a new technique, you're going to feel choppy. You're going to, you know, feel maybe even embarrassed if people are watching you because you're like, oh my gosh, like I just suck at this. But that's literally the point because you're going to get better <laughs> if you just keep drilling. And it yes. provides, memory, you know, that repetition, which allows you to seamlessly transfer it when you are training so that you're not putting a lot of that, that type of thought into it, like the the step by step pieces, like that can just be automatic. Save your energy yeah, for and- other strategies that you want to use. Exactly. In the days, it's like life happens. So sometimes when I can't get my drilling in, 
and or can't find partners because they also have li their own lives. Uh, so sometimes it's not even in my control um, is I'll watch instructionals on something I'm working on. And then I'll sit there and I'll visualize whatever I'm working on. Or if I um, if I'm not working on instructionals at the moment, I'll visualize when I'm drilling for those days and try to get the mental reps in to help create a stronger connection for those muscle memories. Um, because visualizing is just as important as like doing the physical work. 100%. You know, I would say it is crazy how, like for me, I noticed that visualization happens um, more efficiently. This is just completely for me when I'm sleeping. Like it's one of the things I'll do as I sleep. And I think there's, there's some science around like that aspect of, you know, being in that sleepy state, that's that subconscious where it gets deeply rooted. That's why like commercials at night, they always say like, that's when you're going to be like embedded with the messaging that they're trying to share, because that's when our kind of like consciousness low lowers a little bit and it, it, our subconscious comes out a little bit and I'll visualize. And there's been so many times where I have visualized techniques I was working through or something I felt like I was stuck with in a match, like just in the dojo. And I'm like, I couldn't figure this out. And I just visualize at night and then literally could hit it when next time I went to class without actually physically drilling it. And I was like, oh my gosh, it was because I was mentally going over it. And I was like, really seeing where do I put my hand and this, that. And then I was like, let me apply it. Then I'd be able to hit it. I'm like, wow, this is crazy. The power of the visualization and how it can translate. I mean, it doesn't, replace the work you still gotta like kind of do the work but it is a great supplement that does work yeah and I, i'll still okay one i absolutely do the exact same thing like when i'm lying uh in my bed at night and whether it's to go to sleep i'll just start thinking about like what i'm doing and then if uh if it's if i'm tired if i can't go to sleep i'll just continue to do it until i do fall asleep <laughs> um because the same um in Oh, goodness. Uh, the other thing I, I'll use visualization for is so like if I'm ever injured or I can't go in out and go do the thing I want to do is I'll sit there on the side of the mat and I will I'll watch the instruction and then I'll be like visualizing me doing the instruction, because if I can't do it uh, physically, I can at least go watch and get those mental reps in. And then when I'm back, I can go get get at it. Yeah, that's a really good point, because I think that does discourage a lot of athletes when they do get injured it's kind of like well now I can't do anything getting out of that like victim I can't mindset of like no you can still work on the mental aspect and you know there's a billion other things you can work on when you're injured um but from a jujitsu tech technical perspective where you feel like you can't physically engage in the class you can still do these mental visualization kind of techniques and it'll still be reps that you're putting in that will still pay off and that kind of leads me to, I guess, something that we could potentially add on if there is anything else. But I was curious to see if you had any specific mindset work that you do. So visualization is obviously a mindset tool. So since we're on that conversation on that topic, if, if there's anything specific um, that you would add. Um, oh, man. <clears throat> so I feel like actually a lot of the success, like I got my black belt in 2019. And uh, I lost a lot. It was a really hard, um, it was a really hard adjustment. <laughs> and, uh, I lost a lot. Um, and I feel like changing over to Precision Jiu-Jitsu Academy, one of the uh, things, there's two coaches. Um, the primary Jiu-Jitsu coach is uh, Chad Bingham. So I feel like that's where a lot of my Jiu-Jitsu strides have come from, is uh, just changing and developing a new style. But to um, Sarah McMahon, I... Uh, she she's actually really developed um for those who don't know who sarah is she's a silver olympic medalist in wrestling and then she after her career in wrestling she went on to do mma and uh, became a professional um mma fighter for ufc and then bellator and i say all of that because sarah is um uh, she's such an incredible and inspiring woman um you know she was still competing in mma when she was 43 and still holding her own too um so and that's after you know 15 20 years of wrestling i say all of this because she has really helped me and guided my mindset to um allow myself the freedom and um again grace to uh to provide that space so like 
the mindset work has really been a huge factor in the successes I'm finally seeing um, after all of the of the hardships and the ups and downs of black belts. Um, yeah. So other mindset work I'll do besides visualization is I, I firmly believe in, um, especially if you're going through a rough patch, is making sure like you have mantras and affirmations. So if I'm ever feeling really down on myself or I'm just going through a stressful period where outside stress is putting that stress on me and um, affecting my jiu-jitsu during class, I'll try to write out like um, my, my different mantras and affirmations so that I can um, remember whether I feel it or not. I'm going to fake it till I make it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Just to know, because it's like your positive self-talk really affects you. Uh, so like making sure I'm talking positively. I think about like, if I'm not going to say this to a friend, I'm not going to say this to myself. Yeah. Um, so those, I, what other is mindset the, work. Like top two favorite like mantras or affirmations that you find that you use the most often. Just curious. Uh, you know what I uh, top of head, not to put you on the spot. <laughs> Well, I, uh, one of them I tell myself is that like, I am capable. Um, so like I am capable, I am, I am great at jujitsu. And then if I'm working towards like a tournament goal, because a lot of the times there's a lot of pressure when you're t working towards those goals, you're like, am I going to make it? Am I going to be able to do this? Like all of those like thoughts that are really normal to have. Yeah. Um, so I, one of those is like, if I know I'm working towards like a tournament goal, I will say like, I'll remind myself and as I'm doing these, I'm like, I'm thinking about how I'm capable. I'm thinking about how I have good jujitsu. Um, and so another one would be like, um, I will be in, I will be in uh, ADCC world's champion. And I'll think about myself. I'll use the tools of visualization as I'm doing those. So like I'll write it down. I'll take the moment, think about what I'm like, think about uh, how those are true. Mm -hmm. Even if I'm in a bad mood, like, mm -hmm. I will make sure I put one positive thought down. Um, and then, so those are a couple. Um, when I'm writing, I do pre-comp. One of my pre-comp rituals is I write in a journal just to like allow my mind to just dump through. And so one of those is like um, that I say almost every time is like, I win in every group I make. I win in every exchange. I win in every pool. And it's just to confirm myself. It's like, no matter what happens, I will win. I will find a way to win. Um, oh, I just got goosebumps. I'm like, I love that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so those are a few. I, I have like a whole a, a whole thing. I but those are the first ones that came off of my head. <laughs> yeah, I love that. So uh, off off that, those are great tools of visualization. And what you were kind of speaking to is kind of what I like to call is like creating evidence as well. So like you're creating evidence that helps strengthen those affirmations. So it does feel more true in your body and you're really shifting that embodiment of it. It's not just like a thought that you're thinking or something that you're just saying that feels superficial. It can feel that way. And, but once you start to create evidence based off your past experience, that's what helps anchor it in as truth so that you can really start to truly believe it and then start acting from that place of a deeper belief because it's not feeling fake because you're like, no, this is real stuff that has happened. These are real, this is real evidence yes. as to why I'm great at jujitsu. This is real evidence as to X, Y, Z. And so it's like, helps to drown out that doubt that can sometimes come in. Like you said, that is normal, but we have control over how much of our energy we put to those doubtful thoughts, you know? So as long as yes. we keep combating it with evidence as to the contrary, well, then we're strengthening that neural pathway. And that's going to help us build our confidence and our trust in ourselves, with ult which ultimately does translate into our performance. Yes. In um, I, if I was listening right now, I'd be like, well, it must be easy because like, you know, you've done, you've won all these things, you know, you're, you, you, you have great jujitsu, like, so, but there will always be a positive thing that you can pull from something. So when you're in practice and, um, you've hit, you've executed that sweep, or let's say you're inside, you're like, I can't even execute a sweep, Liz, like, um, you're in bottom side control and you successfully work to engage your frames in be able to escape. That is a win. Find your yeah. wins in everything you do because they're, they're there. Um, we're all on different spots. And like, if that, if that's where you are, like maybe you're just starting your journey, like that's, 
maybe that's where your win is for the day and visualize that you've been able to escape. And the next time you're going to get him, you're going to get the close guards, use a scissor sweep and come on top. Like, yes. Love it. I love that. Yeah. Always finding those wins. Cause there's always something positive that you can extract, even if it's making it through the world. <laughs> even if it's yes up after being sick for a week you know like there's yes. always a win that you can extract you just need to frame your mind to look for those wins so you'd mentioned one of the pre-comp uh, rituals that you have which is journaling do you have any other pre-comp rituals or routines um whether it's the week leading up to the competition or in the bullpen and kind of like that process because that can be you know a different kind of transition for people it's like what they do leading up to it the week of as well as once it's go time and you're in that bullpen yeah um <clears throat> so for me I I like to taper I used to be the competitor that would go and uh compete all the way up and like sorry compete not compete uh train up until the day before competing and I stopped doing this when I went to do a warm-up and I rolled my ankle I was like and I was just warming up. So my ankle got injured and I went into the tournament slightly injured already, but that was in my own control. I could have not been um, warming up, it, doing the warm ups and training the day, night before. Um, so I've learned that from me and my mind, I like to taper and Sari um, even says that I'm not tapering enough. I do. I, if I'm competing on Saturday, I like to start depending on how um, how well I'm feeling. Either Tuesday or Wednesday is when I'll I'll stop and start my taper. She would like me to do a full seven days. Um, oh, wow! So I, I'm I'm on yeah. board for three days. I have a three I have a three day golden rule that um, I posted on the Instagram like months ago. And it went like viral and everybody's like, are you kidding me? Not training. Like I, I, I literally like no jujitsu, no jujitsu three days. No. Like if you quit Saturday, you're off Wednesday, Thursday, because one of the things that you want to yes. do is you want to athletically peak, not just physically, yes. but mentally, emotionally, you want to allow your body, your glycogen stores to, you know, let all those carbs go in your glycogen stores. You want to rest. And what I love is I love that feeling where I'm like, burning aching waiting to fight and like that's what you yes. want that's what you want the day of a competition that is the prime time to have that kind of itch is okay great now I have to fight and this person's really gonna get the wrath because I haven't trained and <sighs> not like oh I'm burnt out and I'm tired and now I have this new injury and now I have to put my best foot forward which is impossible because I'm not at my best you know going into this competition so I know it's such a mental shift because like we want to train, right? So it's, it's this combination of like having that self-control, but it's having that self-control because of that bigger picture. You know, the competition is my end goal. And so that requires me to control my urge for instant gratification. Yeah. So that I can lay that gratification for what I really want, which is the gold on the podium. Yes. And alongside that, I if I'm really getting the itch and I really want to go, that's when the visualization comes in. Like for me is if I can't, if it, for me, I, I, it's, I know that my jujitsu, when you are a week out from competition, your hard work is already done. Every, it should be done. Yeah. Like you, you've worked hard. You've done everything you can do physically. Now it's just time to get your mind ready for that competition. And I know different people have different philosophies, but this is for me, mine, like I, I'll use the visualization going in all the way to the rest of the week. Um, so like that, yeah. I, I firmly believe taking the time off it, it's, um, and I will say, so for ADCC, because the uh, ADCC West Coast trials, because it was a week after pans, I only drilled one day that week. And even when I drilled, I shouldn't have drilled. I should have just visualized for the whole entire week um, because it was really hard going from one major competition right into a next. Um, but I will say, what was that? Is it especially different rule sets. Yes. <laughs> and different, <laughs> different gi, no gi, and oh, then yeah. different rule yeah. sets and everything. Um, but I will say when I, because I didn't really do anything for that week, 
when I was uh, getting ready for competition on Saturday to compete for my first round, I was on fire with executing. So there might be something behind what Sarah said for taking uh, seven days. So I know she really wants me to try it. Um, I'm not sure when I'm going to do it this before <laughs> ADCC, but or if it will be for ADCC, but we'll definitely try that because I it was like I was really I was way more hungry than three days for me. And my body was just ready to execute. Like it was really fast. It was fully recovered uh, to be able to do everything. Yeah. Um, yeah. 100%. Uh, I've, I've had that experience currently being pregnant because I not, I noticed that going to class the same amount that I was not necessarily not having a goal, but just like my expectations are different now because like I'm pregnant. I can't do as much as I want. Like, and there's no reason for me to be training 10 rounds. Like I, I, you know, especially when the partners are limited, things like that. So I have been going less. And so the lag time between like the last day I go for the week to like the next one is a good, like five, six days. And I notice that even being pregnant, heavily pregnant, 40 weeks pregnant, <laughs> like I go <laughs> in, I'm still like, I'm murdering because I'm just so deprived. <laughs> I'm so, deprived. <laughs> so like it doesn't even matter the pregnancy doesn't even phase me it's like I just I feel so fresh my grips are so fresh I have zero injuries zero twinges and I'm just like I feel good and I'm also right? stuck for this right now so <laughs> you guys are just gonna get it but yeah so that's the closest I've come to is like that you know maybe five six days so I, I agree I think that that might be a, a nice sweet spot so I'm excited to see how that unfolds for you when you try, you definitely got to give us an update. <laughs> oh, I definitely will. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm on board. <laughs> Wouldn't you know somebody who has experience of like 30 years in a competitive high level elite sport has a lot of amazing advice. I know. But... <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I'm so sorry to digress. I, I realized I didn't tell you all the rest of the pre-comp rituals. Oh, um, yeah, yeah. I'm so sorry. Um, but oh, so oh, I'll take time off, um, depending on it. And for me, um, I, I use whoop, I use a whoop strap. It monitors my heart rate and all of that. Um, and I got it back in 2020 and that was mostly because my husband was like, you train way too much. And I really, this comes out of a place of love and concern for your body and what you're putting yourself through. So mm -hmm. we decided to get a whoop strap so that I wouldn't overexert myself and or I would have a metric that is scientific that I can be like, you're taking a night's rest off. And because I am the type of person that will continue to push until if I, I'm like, um, I'm like the Black Knight of Monty Python and the Holy Grail, where it's like, it's just a flesh wound. It's fine. <laughs> and, I'll, I'll, and I have no arms or legs, but I'm going to I'm going to come bite you. Um, <laughs> So, which is not good because um, over time, I, that might be good for right now, but longevity for my body, that is a terrible idea. So I use WHOOP to help make sure um, I'm taking the time off I need when my body says that, hey, it, we're real tired and or we're sick and you need to take a rest. Um, and I'll use that as well to help. Um, so I'll use that to decide if I'm taking Tuesday or Wednesday off because it's not, I know I can believe in the feeling of my body, but also the scientific metrics of that help me be like, okay, for sure. It's not just feelings. Um, like it's scientifically, like I got the data to say, chill out yeah. and now go and taper. Um, I like to take a bath before I go compete. Um, the night before, whether I have to do it for weight or not, I just like to relax. And if I'm traveling in um, from, if it's like a long flight, I'll try to stretch out if my body feels any. Um, I'll do some yoga for BJJ, about half hour of it. It's just really relaxing. It makes me feel good. And um, and then I've gotten the, something new. It's I'll go, a lot of the times I'm going to the venue for IBGF to sign up for the absolutes on Friday. And if I have to go in there, I'm going to use the opportunity as well to um, be in the clamor and the noise. And I, I'll write down, it's a very different, it's weird. It's like I'm learning that the journaling the night before versus the journaling the day of. Um, 
there's different aspects for it for me. It's like when I go in there and I'm hearing all the clamor, I just think about like, again, I'm visualizing, but I'm visualizing exactly what matches are going to be. And I, so I'll use the opportunity to sit down, hear everything. And it's nice is because there's other matches going, you can use, like, I'm walking out, I'm seeing this. So like, if you have a hard time visualizing or need a steps to start, you can go to the venue and you could watch other people's matches and then start visualizing, okay, I'm here now. How can I do this and use that to help guide you? Um, so I, I've started to do that. And like sometimes my visual when I'm there, it's like, I really hope I fall off the curb and roll my ankle and I can't go compete tomorrow. <laughs> and I know it sounds really terrible, but those thoughts don't go away. It's just how you, you know, that one, you don't actually want to do that. That's just your nerves and anxiety telling you uh, that you don't want to go do this thing. Yeah. Um, but also alongside those nervous nerves, your nerves are there to tell you how excited you are to go do this. Like you get to decide whether you allow the nerves to um, control you to feel excited or control you to say, oh, fuck this shit, what am I doing? Why'd I do this? Um, so yeah, I, I do a lot of journaling, just, just allow all, no matter how negative or wherever those thoughts are, I allow myself to see them, accept them and just say like, that's okay. These are, this is how you feel and how you feel is completely valid. That's okay. Um, but you're still going to go out and fight tomorrow. Yes. <laughs> so how do you see it going? Yes. And one of an important part of saying that is um, I try to say, I will. Your will is incredibly important. And so when I'm writing those out, it's not like I am going to do this or, or like I see myself doing this. No, it's I will go do this. I will get my grips first. I will pull guard. I will go for the takedown and executing how you see it happening. Yes, I love that. Yeah, I think um, when I hear athletes and I'm talking with them and I notice like the language I always point out when I notice they say I'm going to try. I'm going to try to get my grips. I'm like, no, that's not good enough. You can't try to get your grips. You need to assert yourself. You need to make that command. Yes. That, like that will trying is, is not going to cut it, <laughs> you know? No. So yes, yeah, so I really appreciate you kind of sharing that small detail because that does make a huge difference. Um, I'm curious, what kind of music do you like to listen to uh, when you're about to step on there? I've explored a lot of different ones over the years. Um, and I feel like because music does impact our kind of emotional state and how we feel. And so I think knowing, I feel like it's a great thing to have, but knowing how it impacts you is really important because some can really work to benefit you and others like heavy metal. I tried for a while that actually doesn't do me well because I'm already an aggressive fighter. So like, I just get like way too amped and it's almost like you get to the point where you can't bring any calm for me. No, uh, same. And I, also, and I also tried meditation and I was way too relaxed that I actually couldn't like turn on. I was like, shit. I realized we just slapped up and like, I'm thinking about world peace and this is not <laughs> okay right now. Like this is <laughs> up with me and I'm thinking about world peace. Okay. Meditation doesn't work for me. <laughs> Oh man, it's so funny you say this is because I've um I've found I've gone through um a lot of different things to try to find. Um so when I first started competing, I thought like, you know, heavy metal because they were telling me to be incredibly aggressive. Like oh. that was how my coach's advice is when I was in my um white to white to black under my first coach um and a couple of the other coaches at the place, they would recommend to be like incredibly aggressive. So I listened to a lot of metal and I really thought that that would be the way but what I found is when I'm super aggressive, I allow myself open to opportunities for my opponent to capitalize on as well. So uh, I was way too aggressive when I listened to a lot of heavy metal. Um, but now as I've gotten gone through and found like what works for me is um, I'll listen to depend. It really depends on how I feel. So if I'm waking up and I'm feeling really calm, I know that I need some heavy metal or some um, EDM, something with a nice high high beat, high pace um, to get my heart rate up. I never realized how affected I am by music, but um, side tangent story, like I was at a fight to win and I was commentating and then I was gonna go compete on the card later. So I had my whoop 
uh, data up and it it was monitoring um, the heartbeats. So mm -hmm. when I had the music, when I had my headphones off, my heart rate would spike by almost like 10, 15 beats, um, beats more. So when I have my headphones on, it decreases. I give you, and also if you've ever been in the radio, like if you've ever been in your car and had to turn down music when you're driving, it's because you're trying to concentrate. Like, yeah. so music affects, at least for me, heavily. So I recognizing that um, music that's really high paced and heavy beat or metal will make my heart rate go up. So if I'm ever too calm, I'm putting that one on. Um, and then if I'm, if I'm um, way too calm, sorry, if I say, if I'm not calm and my heart rate, which is typically recently it's been, is my heart rate's been higher, is I'll put on um, more low paced music and or um, stuff that makes me feel good. So like I listen to musicals uh, or I, there's a couple of movies that are musicals like The Greatest Showman or. Um, oh, no, that is my favorite of all time. I'm seeing that every single day. Oh, my God. Yeah. So that's actually one of my like top um, pre-comp uh, playlists is The Greatest Showman. I also really like um, Eurovision of Fire, uh, the saga of, of, oh my goodness, Eurovision, oh shoot, Fire Saga. I, I forget, I'm missing part of that there's, but it's the one with Will Ferrell and um it they it came out during the pandemic, which is hilarious because Eurovision didn't happen that year, um, <laughs> twenty twenty. But regardless, they have some great songs. It's um, it's musically ish, but they're, it's um, really great. I really like the the music, and so like when I'm going through, I, um, they're more like slow paced songs. And then when the one that's on repeat for me that's slow is uh, actually the Beach Boys, uh, Kokomo. So that's almost one of the ones of like I'm listening to it about to go on um it's just to like calm my nerves because oh. a lot of the times I'm 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 ready to go I'm really excited to be there and my nerves and how um high my heart rate is I need to calm down so for me when I'm warming up I like to before I get into the bullpen I try to peak my heart rate to um the highest I can like I would so I use the whoop to do this like I try to peak into the 90 to 100 percent of what my heart rate is and then after I've hit that I'll calm back down I'll, I'll go check in sit in the bullpen and then I, I like to say like I lay down like a dead body because I'm just trying to lay down on my heart rate to go back down to normal um a normal area yeah. <laughs> as normal as it can get because most yeah. of the time it's too high and I'll be listening to music and just visualizing so if you ever see me just laying down in the bullpen, that's what I'm trying to do is just try to go down. And I, I find like if I don't have that time where I just get to allow myself to like allow my heart rate to go down, it's um it's much harder for me to perform the way I want to. So I recognize I need to um, I need to go in and visualize. Yes. And alongside that, too, is um, because I know I do breathing exercises it's I do box breathing, um, which is like five, five, I do fives because it's really easy um, or a little bit more depending on what I need. But five in, hold for five, five out, hold for five. Yeah. And so it'll just help me try to regulate my breathing and decrease my um, heart rate, um, which has been very helpful. Yes. Yeah. You know, breath work is definitely something that I encourage. So it's awesome that you're doing that. And um, there's lots of science that helps with that aspect. So if you do have those higher uh, nerves or just that higher heart rate, definitely it's a great way to regulate that. So yeah, thank you so much for sharing all of that. That's so fun to just hear a little bit about your process. Um, I'd love to transition a little bit just for some like fun questions as we wrap up. Um, but just for those who are interested in your perspective, I'm curious, what does having or being a black belt mean to you? Ooh, okay. Um, I mean, it just, that's that's a that's a good question, a great question because um, honestly, it, it's the the dedication that you've put in, and then it's the dedication to a sport or a martial art for the time you've put in. Um, and I also feel like alongside that, it 
it comes with a large amount of responsibility um, because it's like you, you are, when you become a black belt, there's so, it, it truly is like a, like a pyramid amount of people like you, white belts, very deep foundational um, end of the pyramid. And then by the time you go up, there's so many people that have, each person's journey is different, but there's a lot of people that don't make it there. Um, so alongside that, it means that you, there's a lot of responsibility to help the other people get there with you. Um, mm -hmm. like one of my, I know I'm at a really successful academy when you see a lot of the like, same people you start with or have like taught fundamental classes to, and they're still there. Um, it, it really means that there's, you've helped shepherd a lot of these people into the higher belts. So the responsibility of like helping others to go up. Um, yeah. That's beautiful. Yeah. That's, it's so true. Yeah. It's definitely fewer at the top, but you know, part of the role as being that higher rank is to help encourage and, you know, support those other people from staying there as well. That's definitely a sign of a healthy gym. In my opinion is like when you see a lot of white to, you know, brown black belts, you know, that's, awesome or even people that come in at blue belt and stay till you know black belt that's huge because we know what that dedication looks and feels like you know to actually make it to the top and so if you're able to do that and repeat that with multiple people who are consistent that's a really good sign of a healthy culture for sure absolutely yes and i know that you're really busy with full-time job and competitions but in any sliver of the day, I know that you have some cats. So is there anything that you enjoy as far as hobbies when you do have any extra time that is unrelated to jujitsu? I, I do. And I think it's incredibly important to, uh, I'm just going to plug this in, is that you, there was a you before jujitsu. And it's important to, if you liked that you and you enjoyed the things you used to do, to hold on to those. Because Unfortunately, if you ever get injured or something takes you away from jujitsu, you'll need the you'll need those other hobbies. So, like before jujitsu, I did uh, competitive war, tabletop war gaming. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a big nerd. Um, yes. So, what that those who don't know what that means, it's um, I played Warhammer 40k. It's a miniature game where you have to put the pieces together and then you have to paint them and then you get to go play with them. Um, so it's a really involved um, game, uh, oh. war game. And I feel like uh, the war gaming part, the strategy is why I also love Jiu Jitsu because like, instead of playing with the pieces, I am the piece uh, oh, to be. <laughs> yeah. So I, I used to do that quite a bit. Um, now I, I the, the game can sometimes last like three to five hours. So I don't have the capacity to do that as much, but I'm still working to try to, um, you, you can do the hobby aspect of it. So like yeah. painting, putting this together. Um, and I also really enjoy making uh, jewelry. So like, because I'm a nerd, I'll take, um, I like to take the polyhedral sets of the dice. So, um, and I'll make like, earrings necklaces uh hair pieces all of those type of things um in the free time yeah and then i'm uh <laughs> i love kombucha so i brew kombucha i think having <laughs> having these little things like aspects it's like really important that you like the, all those things are things i really enjoy and you need to have balance in your life so find like i have to schedule the time in because a lot of times i'm so tired that i won't I'll be like, I'm just too tired to do this stuff. But when, I, which is important, if I need the time to rest, I allow myself the time to rest. But um, I think it's still important to have those other hobbies and to engage with them um, because it's, jujitsu is a large part of my life, but it can't be my every everything, uh, which is counterintuitive for a lot of other people. Like jujitsu is life. Um, yeah, I, I do. I do. Agree with you, I think a lot of people have learned the hard way, though, when they did adopt jujitsu as their only thing in their life. And then they do get injured, which is the case with any sport that somebody identifies with as 
their whole identity. If you get severely injured and you can't do that, like a lot of people enter depression, a lot of people lose yeah. their sense of self because everything they knew was this one thing. So having these other things, like almost like putting your eggs in other baskets and, you know, allowing different aspects of your expression, you know, just make for a more rich life experience and just make for more balance in your life, you know? And I love these hobbies that you have. They're so freaking awesome. And it makes you even more, even more cool to know that you can kick ass and, you know, make jewelry. And I think again, um, just giving a permission slip to other women to, you know, just have life, like have a life, you know, and just like enjoy the things that you love to do in the kitty cat cinnamon. Is this one cinnamon? <laughs> that one's paprika. I have two, um, cinnamon and paprika. They're the spice girls. Oh, I cat. love it. Oh my gosh. <laughs> love that. Um, yeah, so fun. So fun. So then the final question would be uh, just a, a fun question since you do have experience as a top player too. Um, what is your, at least at the moment, your favorite submission and or takedown? Uh, okay. <laughs> um, I feel like right now my favorite submissions is the, like I've really been enjoying the setups in into the toy bar or um, an inverted arm bar or arm saddle. It's those are all syn um, synonymous terms with each other. Um, but I, I really have been enjoying uh, entering into that one. Um, and that's how I won uh, two two of the, like those were two of the entries that I entered in for ADCC was was the Choi Bars. Um, it's well, I saw a lot of fun. I call, not that what I call, but like what I know it to be as the Juji turn, which is a judo term, but that's the rolling arm bar. That yes so, 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 did it not too long ago and it was like you had the arm bar and then you flipped her over and finished on your back basically like they do a forward roll when you have the arm that's what we call the juji turn in judo but it, i mean that was one of the submissions that you're talking about in regards to the arm bar yes so it's like the choy bar is like before if i can't finish it from the side it's the inter of like how you're hooking the arm so it's like you'll you'll grab an under hook and um and control the shoulder and bring the arm to you and flip the leg over their back across to the far side hip. And okay. so like that's, that, that position is, is um, called the toy bar named after, um, oh, I'm going to mess up his name. I'm, I don't want to ruin it. <laughs> <laughs> um, Google it so she doesn't have to, you know, embarrass herself. <laughs> Just kidding. Thank you. It's, it's C-H-O-I. <laughs> um, <laughs> But that the entering in, it's become incredibly popularized um, from Lachlan Giles based off of, um, from the person who, who, oh my gosh, there's a, there's a lot of videos on it. It's really cool. Um, I love the submission because it's, you can get it from a lot of different positions. So like it's counterintuitive. Like when somebody comes in for, they have you in half guard and they're reaching for your head, you can actually enter into this arm bar from there. And so it's like from half guard, you want to control the head. It's a very common reaction for people to do. It, yeah. Yeah. it allows you to be offensive from something that's really traditionally um, typical, which yeah. I like because it surprises people. Um, yeah. My favorite way to enter in would be off of the double unders, though, because a lot of people, when they start stacking you, they feel that they have that control over you. But it, and they don't expect to be attacked um, from that. Yeah. They don't expect their arms to be attacked from there. Um, so like I. Yeah, we got to look that one up, guys. So make sure you put that one in your journal to do's for jujitsu. <laughs> and what about <laughs> playing more guard lately? But um, as far as takedowns, anything that's coming to your mind or was something that you used to like? I, oh my goodness. So uh, because I've been working for planning to do ADCC trials, I've done, I've really stepped up back into wrestling and doing a bunch of wrestling classes. So the first one that I'll just say the first one that popped to mind, the first one that popped to mind was uh, a bump by or a slide by. Um, so it's like, if you have a collar, collar and the person, the collar tie and the other person has a collar tie, you're using your, not your collar tie, but the opposite arm, you're going to bump, you're going to look at your wristwatch and you're going to bump right behind their elbows and arch your back really high and start turning the corner to take to take their back so oh, it either oh. allows you to bump into the back or um 
you can also like pick them up and re return them to the mat, which is always fun. Return them to the mat. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> nice. I love it. I love it. And so final question would be just for those who want to connect with you, what's the best way to connect with you? I uh, Instagram, uh, Miss Demonette is the, it, that was my gamer name. I'm married. I thought about changing it to Mrs. for a lot of times. Um, but Miss Stevenette is the best way to, um, to get a hold of me. Um, yeah, I, I do have a Facebook that has like a, a professional page. You can also go follow as well if you aren't on Instagram. Um, but I do find like the, I'm on Instagram the most to be able to get a, you know, a hold of me. Um, yeah. Awesome. And I've thought about changing Miss Demonette to a, like Liz Jitsu or something like yeah. that. But Demon is is um, one of the characters from my gaming when I when I was really heavily involved in gaming. That was from that, so that's why I ch I haven't changed it. I don't think I will change it. Yeah, because... no, that's your persona. Yeah, <laughs> your avatar. I love it. All right, Liz. Well, thank you so much for again being on the show, sharing just all the fun things about you, your, you know, journey and, you know, your rituals and just, you had so much wisdom to offer. And I know this can be such a value packed episode and also a fun episode, just getting to know another high level black belt. Um, so for anyone listening to this, if there's anything that you, you know, really took away that resonated with you again, you know, reaching out to Liz to thank her, you can just uh, share it with us on our social media at body by boss LLC. And again, thanks for tuning in Liz. And we will see you guys in the next episode. Thank you.